All right, good evening again, everyone. And welcome to the 38th annual Elsa Govayo Memorial Lecture. Um, it's good that we have been able to make it here in Jamaica. We like to say, even though it's a kind of misinterpretation of the passage, we like to say where two or three are gathered, you know? Well, these aren't the easiest of circumstances to have held the Elsa Govaya lecture in, but we have persisted and we have been able to hold the lecture and I'm very happy for that. And I'm very happy that those of you who are here, both in person as well as online, have been able to make it and welcome to you. Welcome our Dean Sylvia Cohenberg, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities. Welcome to the head of the history department, Professor James Robertson. Welcome to our, of course, distinguished guest lecturer, Professor Dave Dunkley. Um, we are already off to a bit of a late start, so I'm not going to delay the program anymore. I'm just going to invite our Dean, Professor Cohenberg, to come and bring greetings on behalf of the faculty. Dean. So um, welcome both those gathered here and um, our participants on, online on YouTube where this lecture is being streamed live. And I'm glad to know that we have this sort of extended possibility for an audience. The Elza Govaya lecture is a long tradition. I used to really <clears throat> look forward to hearing Professor Roy Auger's introduction of Elsa Govaya every year, and I'm really sorry that um, he's no longer able to um, introduce that fig the figure of Elsa Govaya to us, because it really put her down as um, introduced her to us as a multifaceted and extremely important person. Um, in many different ways as a historian, but also as a person of firsts. She was um, the first female Caribbean historian. Uh, she's the person uh, who uh, put the um, concept of the slave society uh, on the map and made it um, something that no historian of this uh, region can do without in understanding um, the history of the Caribbean. And in a way, she can be recruited uh, to you know, look at Caribbean history in so many different ways. So as a first female historian here, of course, gender is very much on the agenda. And so I'm um, interested to see that that is on the agenda for today's lecture. This is also a lecture that crosses disciplines. Um, I'm very um, interested to see some colleagues here from different departments where I know there's an interest in Rastafari studies. And so, um, on behalf of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, um, thank you for being here, Professor Dunkley, and I look forward to uh, learning from your lecture. At this point, we should be having, a, well, sorry, Prof. Coenberg a while ago mentioned Sir Roy's legendary um, recollections of, of Elsa. Um, a few years ago, we decided that we would take some of the stress off of Sir Roy, because those of us who used to go to Elsa knew the, the kind of toll it took on Sir Roy to, to recall um, his experiences with Elsa. So we decided some years ago to actually do a video tribute um, to Elsa Govail so that in a way, we could also get to know Elsa from her own words and her own pictures and her own experiences. And that is what we'd like to play for you right now. So, um, AV text.
when I was at college as an undergraduate student, that is at University College London, I did English history, not West Indian history, and it was not until I became a postgraduate student working for my doctorate that I began to do West Indian history. The name Elsa Gavaya had become a legend before she arrived in England in 1945. Most Guyanese mentioned her name with reverence and indeed awe, as she was the first woman to have broken the tradition by winning the one territorial scholarship in Guyana. That scholarship took her to University College London, and there, in her final year, she topped the class, won the Pollard Prize for English History, the prestigious prize that was awarded to the best history scholar at University College London. It was a feat which made the senior professor at UCL write to the director of colonial scholars and describe her as remarkable. An unmistakable feature of Elsa Gavaya's career is that she was the first person to teach a flagship course in West Indian history at this university. This was what she was recruited to do. Elsa Gavaya and this very special second year course in West Indian history became inseparable for three decades. I do the teaching in West Indian history, which is my special interest, and I also do the teaching in the history of Latin America. In addition to this, uh, I do research in West Indian history, which is the subject that most particularly concerns me. Elsa Govaya is foundational to this faculty. So foundational is she that even before she was so appointed, her appointment was called for, not by name, but by post in the Urban Commission which set up this university. The Urban Commission's report includes a specific reference to the need for a lecturer in Caribbean history when the university began to ensure the issue of Caribbean identity. And Elsa Govaya was the first such appointee. Now, you plan to go to England soon, I gather. Um, what exactly are you going to undertake this time? At this time, I'm hoping to do some work in the Public Record Office, where, as I say, it's possible to find a great deal of material in a relatively short time. And there, the main object of my search is going to be to find the British West Indian slave laws. I'm particularly interested in British West Indian history during the 18th century, which is, of course, the great period of slavery, and I'm working on the slave laws, and this is one of the things that I should be doing in London during this summer. You can go to France or America, India, Asia, or Australia, but you must come back to London City. I wrote the historiography of the British West Indies as part of a series of historiographies dealing with the Americas. The object of this book was to discuss the work of historians of the British West Indies and to try to evaluate the work that they'd written. The author, for all her scholarly detachment, writes with an earnestness born of wide knowledge and deep sympathy, which relatively few West Indian historians have previously achieved. She writes in a clear, lucid, unaffected style, which is a pleasure to read. In general, Miss Gavire's criticisms are well-informed, penetrating and scrupulously fair. With her own wide knowledge of the West Indian past, she is able not only to describe what the author said, but also to explain why they said it.
Well, my impressions of federal development, I should say, are those of a, an individual who is very much in favor of a closer union of the West Indies, so that to some extent, perhaps I may be regarded as biased. But I regard myself as a West Indian and that I should like to see the Federation succeed. And so I was able to use West Indian history as a social science tool to explain to campus audiences the historical foundations of our modern West Indian dilemmas. She put history at the center of the enterprise of making us West Indians. For 30 years with her other colleagues, they ensured that the region came to understand for the first time, really, that they had a history. They were more than an appendage of the British Empire, but had something with its own internal dynamic. And in that regard, their graduates, people they taught, the teachers who left here in the 50s and 60s, returned throughout the Caribbean, not consciously doing it, but even evangelizing and building Caribbean identity. And crucial to that would have been the work of Elsa Govaya. We honor her first as a scholar. We honor her also as an inspiring teacher. And we remember her as our mentor an exemplar. We honor her because she pioneered and established West Indian history as an academic discipline. And finally, we remember her for the person that she was. For Elsa Gavaya. And here we are remembering the dark woman who searched out meaning in the dust and left us the enigma of her going. I find contact with young students whose minds are open to new ideas, a very stimulating experience indeed, and even though it is also exhausting, I don't think I should like to do without it. and whose introductory undergraduate lecture series on Caribbean history refocused attention away from the Europeans uh, and their colonists towards the ordinary people of the region. And in the process, taking the varied paths of the current people of these islands out of obscurity and into, uh, that imperial history had assigned them and putting them, the forebears of today's students, into the foreground of analyses of this region. That's why the department holds these lectures, and I'm very proud to bring back an alumni of our department to fulfill this year's lecture in the series. Uh, he's a graduate of this department, uh, which I have the current privilege to be chair. He was an undergraduate here, uh, coming out in 94. Uh, he undertook an MA here on John Tharp, a fabulously wealthy planter of extorted wealth who co-founded Falmouth. He, after that, he came back, he uh, went to uh, Warwick and did a PhD um, on amelioration, the efforts to ease slavery so that it could be carried on a bit longer. Um, and then came back here and was a lecturer. We were colleagues at that juncture. Uh, and was then headhunted to the university, well, was on the job market and the University of Missouri had the great good fortune to headhunt him to their flagship campus at Columbia. He's now chair of black studies there, and it joins with various other things like peace studies and things that matter. He's written a whole string of books, um, 
which you should look up in the library. Uh, and it, going basically from the 1780s up to Leonard Howell, who we'll be talk, talking about today in uh, the interwar period, but in one paper, looking forward to Michael Manley and the Institute of Jamaica. It is an exhilarating range as well, and I look forward to handing you over to the main speaker of the evening, the person you've come to hear, Professor Dunkley. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Robertson, and thank you for inviting me. Um, it's certainly a pleasure to return to the place that um, made me into a historian and actually helped me to identify that thing that I, I wanted to do with my life, which was to write something. And I just didn't know at the time what it would be. And then I encountered history and a slate of very interesting historians who just turned me on to the subject. And I haven't stopped since. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Dean. Thank you for your introductory remarks. Um, former colleagues, um, and of course my wife and my two children. <laughs> my two sons are here. And if you, and let me just apologize up front, because if you hear a loud outburst, he's three years old. Okay, <laughs> all right, but we prepped him. So, good evening once again, everyone. And from the title you see there, what we will examine tonight is one of the lesser known segments of Jamaican history, the struggle against colonialism by Rastafari women. These women, I think, can be aptly referred to as the outsider within. Sociologist Patricia Hill Collins introduced the concept of the outsider within in 1986 um, in an article entitled Learning from the Outsider Within and then returned to it in a subsequent book, a very influential book in 1990, um, Black Feminist Thought. The concept really tries to encapsulate the paradoxical experience of being an outsider and an insider within social groups, and society at large. Though Collins mainly used it to explore the experiences of African-American women in domestic employment in white homes, particularly affluent white homes, she also indicated that its application could, be, could extend to black women in other contexts. One such instance is the early Rastafari women in Jamaica. Marginalized by society due to their religious beliefs, these women also encounter gender bias within Rastafari. However, as insiders, they were instrumental in its genesis and early development, owing to their understanding of its religion and political ideology. Is that for me? <laughs> Thank you. This understanding included strategies to negotiate colonial suppression, sustaining Rastafari's anti-colonialism based on viewing the emperor and empress, especially for women, of Ethiopia as their promised return of the Messiah. The resistance of Rastafari women was a multifaceted effort. They not only stood against the oppressive burdens of British colonialism, and the residual impacts of slavery, but also fought for recognition and equality within their communities. In the 1930s, a significant issue arose among women in Jamaica, coinciding with the emergence of Rastafari in that decade. This issue was partly inspired by the struggle of British, British suffragists who achieved universal adult suffrage 
in Britain in 1928. The women of Jamaica perceived the freedom to express their opinions within the formal structures of national and international politics as necessary for the country's development. They argued that this freedom would allow them to voice their viewpoints on the political ideologies shaping their country's social and economic policies, encompassing poverty alleviation, unemployment, education, agricultural and industrial strategies, and the role of religion in national politics. And by the way, when you look at the figures for religious um, affiliation in the 1930s and 1940s in Jamaica, all of them are dominated by women in sheer numbers, okay, mostly women, including the category called other religions under which they would have placed Rastafari. The women's interest in freedom of expression extended beyond Jamaica's geographical boundaries, including the pursuit of international support for the anti-colonial struggles in the Caribbean and Africa. As these women struggled for the liberty to articulate their political viewpoints and ensure their role in nation building, they turned to religion for inspiration. They, in disseminating their political perspectives, they advocated women's autonomy within both private and public spheres, including their religious, um, their religious institutions. They covered various topics. Um, voting rights was there, racial discrimination, and gender bias and economic development. In 1934, the Baptist Women's Federation echoed the influence of religion in helping to shape national politics. On March 7, 1934, Jamaica's capital, Kingston, was abuzz with excitement as the Gleaner published. It reported a gathering to celebrate the sixth anniversary of the Lloydon branch of the Baptist Women's Federation, which took place at the historic East Queen Street Baptist Church. The organization was the result of the dedication of a woman named Garland Hall who everybody affectionately referred to as Mama Hall. Through yearly contributions of a penny a week, women of the Lloyd and Branch demonstrated the strength of collective action. Their subscriptions accumulated into significant sums over time, and they gathered in large numbers to deliberate on self-determination in both individual and national levels, at both individual and national levels, and women's solidarity. These discussions reinforced their determination to influence national politics by tackling voting rights and gender bias in economic development and embodied their concept of sisterhood, of a sisterhood. Yes, they coined that term. This sisterhood was committed to advocating gender equality in the private and public domains. By 1935, the women of Jamaica were not only were not merely expecting, they were demanding that their voices be heard on the national and international stages. Feminist writer and Pan-Africanist, um, Beryl Deleon, Deleon, wrote a thought-provoking uh, uh, question in the Gleaner. She asked, what are the women of Jamaica going to do about the war in Abyssinia, Ethiopia? This question, served, this question served as a reminder of women's accomplishments, highlighting their untapped potential to shape the country's responses to global events. With the passage of universal adult suffrage in Jamaica in 1944, women began to take up crucial roles in the political and economic stewardship of the country. In that same transformative year, the Women's Federation was established, rallying women to safeguard their civil rights and occupy posts within government structures. Tragically, and I do say tragically, early Rastafari women were excluded from such groups primarily due to class and religious prejudices, also harbored by women of middle and upper class strata. Rastafari women were the outsiders within. 
Rhoda Reddock has pointed out that some of these middle-class feminists perceive their relationship with working-class women as more an act of charity than an expression of solidarity. Consequently, the responses of middle-class and upper-class women to the socioeconomic and political struggles of disadvantaged women, included Rastaf including Rastafari women, often fail to empower those from the lowest stratum to seek avenues for upward social mobility. Instead, the charity was mainly directed at helping women of the working class and peasantry to become more adept at low income work, thereby perpetuating their status in the lower income brackets. Despite being marginalized and overlooked, however, Rastafari women raised their voices against international acts of aggression towards Africans all over, notably the Italian occupation of Ethiopia from 1935 to 1941. On the domestic front, they opposed the oppressive instruments of the colonial state, such as law enforcement officials and judicial representatives. Even when faced with a society that stigmatized them as a dangerous cult, I'm sorry, they continued to uphold their rights to freedom of worship and political expression. Delrosa Francis, one of the Rastafari women I want to talk a little bit about, who defended her right to freedom of religious and political expression against a district constable, Robert Powers, embodied the determination characteristic of early Rastafari women, women's resistance to the social oppression of the 1930s, leveraging what could be described as a suffragist understanding of civil liberties, Francis sought justice for herself and her supporters, including her partner James Finley and another Rastafari woman, Rachel Patterson, who, by the way, had also protested um, the Rastafari protested the Rastafari founder Leonard's, Leonard Howell's sedition um, charges in 1930, earlier in 1934, I think March it was. Francis and four other women made use of petitions as strategic tools to instigate significant societal changes, symbolic of strategies used by the abolitionist movement of the 1830s. In the colonial period, petitions often represented the dominant means of socio-political redress available to marginalized communities like Rastafari women, who otherwise had severely restricted access to platforms for expressing their grievances to the government. These historical documents, the petitions, offer valuable insights into their experiences and reveal their agency in various issues, including employment status, marital relations, parenting, um, religious affiliation, and political activism. Through petitions in 1934, uh, Francis and her supporters resisted what they described as the unfair ruling of the resident magistrates and the local justice of the peace who presided over her case involving Constable Powers in the parish of St. Thomas. They alleged that the justices conspired with Powers to prosecute and incarcerate them unjustly. In their counteraction, Francis and her supporters lodged a petition for fair justice, emphasizing their demand for equality while declaring themselves, while declaring themselves, and here's the kicker, loyal and dutiful subjects of the British crown. One might naturally ask, how could they simultaneously resist colonialism while affirming loyalty to the British crown? Indeed, we may be tempted to rush to judgment, as I was, and many have been. However, unraveling this paradox requires, I think, understanding the historical context. Since the period of slavery, or rather I should say epoch, because it lasted so long. Since slavery, Jamaica's subjugated have used various strategies of resistance. 
These strategies included manipulating the same systems and mechanisms used to colonize and enslave them. One approach involved asserting their rights as British subjects to challenge the colonial system from the inside. Historically, the peasantry often exhibited deference towards the British crown in their anti-colonial appeals. However, this deference should not be mistaken for naive admir admiration, but instead viewed as tactical flattery, a distinction recognized by insightful colonial leaders at the time. This approach was neither utilized to endorse colonialism, nor to champion what God human, uh, historians God Human and Eric Hobsbawm termed populist legitimism, or the assertion of non-rebellion against the queen. This was not a display of loyalty. Instead, it represented a strategic endeavor to subvert the colonial system from within. In 1865, for instance, and let's take a little departure, because this is very important. In 1865, for instance, laborers in St. Anne's Parish submitted a petition to the Secretary of the Royal Commission demanding fair government policies toward people experiencing poverty, including access to cultivable land and impartial justice. The Commission was entrusted with investigating the Morant Bay Rebellion, which need no, needs no introduction, but decided that the reverence to the Crown was disingenuous and dismissed the petition as, quote, merely venerating the queen with an almost more than English reverence, unquote. Out of 108 signatories, only 26 were literate, casting further doubt on the petitioner's actual knowledge of their declared loyal and dutiful subjecthood. Yet, evidence of simmering anti-colonial discontent surfaced as well as demonstrated by, the letter, by a letter to the Falmouth Post editor in 1865, noting the conspicuous absence of celebratory events in Trelawney Parish for Queen Victoria's 46th birthday. Fundamentally, women like Francis, while asserting their British subjecthood, used this monarchical veneration to lobby for justice and equality within the society. Their intention was less about affirming loyalty to the British crown and more about utilizing every avenue to confront and expose the oppressive structures of the colonial system. The government indeed recognized the political implications of the issues highlighted in Francis and her supporters' 1934 petitions, as they emphasized corruption in the colonial government. Upon receiving the petitions, acting governor Arthur Jelf forwarded them to his deputy, the acting colonial secretary, Bertie Easter, highlighting the urgency and significance of the issues raised by the Rastafari women. The petitions indicated that the justices of the peace, which might sound familiar, I'm just saying. The petitions indicated that the justices of the peace should have recused themselves from the case due to their ties with constable powers. Instead, the petitioners were sent to the general penitentiary. It existed, a prison typically reserved for offenses as grave as grand theft, homicides, sedition, or treason. Assigning them to the general penitentiary was clearly punishment. But the intention was also dis to discourage other Rastafari followers from challenging the colonial government. Such a severe penalty for what should have amounted to a misdemeanor. Because what happened really was that she had an altercation with Powers because Powers said something to her that is out to get all the court damn Rasta people in St. Thomas. And she said, you're rude. And she said that the only reason why you can talk to me like that as a woman is because you don't have a woman who will stay with you. And he got upset. So it was a misdemeanor. So such a severe penalty for what should have amounted to a misdemeanor highlighted the bias against Francis and the Rastafari movement. It also illustrated how the colonial justice system could be weaponized as an instrument of oppression against marginalized segments of Jamaican society. 
The fact that Frances was sent to prison while her case was still pending also indicates the combined prejudice from the intersectionality of gender, religion, social class, and politics encountered by early Rastafari women. These women had to exercise great caution, hence loyal and dutiful, and skill in negotiating the socio-political landscape, pinpointing the most effective methods to assert their rights and make their voices heard. Because, the dis because of discrimination tied to their Rastafari identity, they avoided emphasizing, for example, their religious affiliations in their petitions. That's a serious strategy to say, or to rather neglect to say, I am Rastafari. Instead, they focused, and they did this, I think, to seek, while, while seeking to sidestep further discrimination. Instead, they focused on their civil rights, accusing the authorities of misconduct and corruption and compelling the colonial administration to directly address their grievances. Moreover, they resisted patriarchal norms within, the Rastaf within Rastafari, refraining from involving external parties in these internal matters. Okay, the strategy did not, was not invented today. They confronted social injustice without having their internal battles overshadow this goal. In other words, they were very much aware of the divide and conquer strategy Europeans had used for centuries to facilitate colonialism. Thus, the women's strategies shielded them from further criticism and bias and preserved their unity, the unity of their movement amid social oppression. The petition demonstrated, the petitions rather, demonstrated the women's community-driven activism or community feminism, a concept coined by our very own historian Eula Taylor to describe women who balance their familial, the activism of women who balance their familial and personal lives with a commitment to communal and racial uplift, thereby challenging patriarchal values and norms. They could do it inside and outside. Furthermore, the petition, sub, the petition that was submitted by Amelia Gordon, a member of the Union Baptist Church, is suggestive of the community alliances forged by Rastafari women. Many Baptist women retained what scholars refer to as dual affiliation, a dual affiliation with Rastafari and the church. This was not a man's domain. Women were involved in it too during the 1930s, indicating a religious um, solidarity, representing the intersection of religion and activism within these two communities, Rastafari and the Baptist Church. As Francis and her supporters rallied and submitted their petitions, a sense of urgency was instilled within the colonial government. No surprises there. The acting colonial secretary, Easter, Bertie Easter, and the acting governor, Arthur Jelf, were under significant pressure to address the escalating issue swiftly and effectively. Their primary objective was to provide Governor Edward Denham with assurance and evidence of their control over what De Denham disparagingly labeled, disparagingly labeled as a deluded cult of escapists. Denham reduced the movement's significance to a temporary aberration, overlooking its continued influence and the threat of political dissent it posed. After all, the governor's advisors, including the police high command, they had been working to curtail the significance of the Rastafari in the eyes of Denham, ultimately shaping his perception of the Rastafari as nothing more than a deluded collective of escapists. And just as an aside, Denham's diaries were used by people like Ken Post to make a big point about Rastafari not being numerically significant at, the point, at that point. But this was all part of, a, of, a, um, of an, an attempt to give Denham the impression that the police was effective in subduing this, this, this movement. So that's why that is particular com, um, issue is important too. 
Even with the stark allegations against the police and judges in the petitions, the acting colonial secretary Easter denied an official inquiry, a denial aimed at preventing agitation among the peasantry and the working class Rastafari supporters. As such, the government's official response, issued in letters dated September 14, 1934, stated their inability to interfere in court matters indirectly pointing the petitioners toward an appeal, a court appeal. However, the implication was that for low-income persons, particularly those identifying as Rastafari, such an appeal process would likely be drawn out and riddled with the same corruption they were protesting. While some legislatures like R. Ehrenstein, the representative of St. Thomas, where the people were from in the Legislative Council representative, opposed allocating public funds for appeals. The confidential minute paper from Easter's office suggested that the petitioners were conscious of their bleak chances in the appeal court. The minute paper indicated that an appeal could trigger a flurry of actions that the government would have to be prepared to handle. Despite the obstacles, the fact remained that Francis and her supporters, through petitions, through their petitions, played a significant role in challenging the colonial government and defending their movement. As a woman, Francis grappled with society's patriarchal norms and the government's adversarial stance towards the Rastafari. Still, her case embodied the refusal to remain silent in the face of colonial injustice, displaying independence and empowerment, displaying the independence and empowerment of the early Rastafari women, including Edna Fisher, who has been largely overlooked in the history of the movement, but forged one of the most impactful organizations to resist colonialism while the government was under the impression that the movement was dissipating. In January 1959, the police tallied only 1,640 members within Rastafari. This revelation followed what the authorities dubbed the last raid and dismantling of the pinnacle community of the previous year. That's Leonard Howell's community. Scattering its inhabitants across the parishes of St. Thomas and Clarendon, others, others displaced found a haven in Tradiga Park and Central Village in St. Catherine, locations closer to their disbanded Pinnacle home. For the police, the dissolution of Pinnacle signaled the weakening of Rastafari's influence. However, in 1958, evidence emerged that the Rastafari was still growing and gaining traction in various parts of the country. Fisher and the Reverend Claudius Henry launched the African Reformed Church of God in Christ in St. Andrew in the spring of 1959. The ARC, that's, I'm going to refer to it as because it's a mouthful, African Reformed Church of God in Christ, ARC, remember that. The ARC did not represent a new form of the Rastafari community. Instead, it revived elements of the disbanded pinnacle community, including communal living, education, political activism, and advocacy for black nationalism. Like pinnacle, the ARC's black nationalism promoted African consciousness, cultural pride, and political self-determination, diverging from the mixed or blended nationalist agenda of local political leaders. These leaders sought a merged Jamaican identity, or the Caribbean identity you hear heard being referred to earlier, that included British and European cultures. However, the ARC,
However, the ARC favored an African-centered approach, emphasizing political, social, and economic independence from the West. In practical terms, the ARC stressed African heritage and traditions, forging close links with particularly Ethiopia as a beacon of African sovereignty for obvious reasons. Um, the Jamaican authorities noted the similarities between the ARC and the Howellites, the Pinnacle community. Um, the, and the ARC increasingly, in, ARC's increasing popularity indicated its leading position within Rastafari of the late 1950s. The similarities between the ARC and Pinnacle were noticed in the courtrooms in Jamaica. Justice Herbert Duffus remarked on the parallels during the 1960 trial of the ARC leadership, accused of treason felony, and we'll get back to that. Duffus noted that Howell himself prosecuted for sedition in 1934 and sentenced to a two-year term of hard labor, had assumed a role akin to that of Henry, the ARC's spiritual guide. Duffus further observed that Henry, like Howell, had positioned himself as a prophetic figure leading Jamaica's ideological return to Africa. Now, Jamaica is what the judge was worried about, not the Rastafari, that this was a national agenda. This is what they sensed in the ARC. Despite a numerical contraction in its ranks, Rastafari had spread its roots into 10 of the island's 14 parishes by 1959. Its influence had not waned, but found its expression in new and diverse forms. Major and minor political parties were aware of the movement's enduring sway um, and courted the support of Rastafari leaders right across the spectrum. Its influence was also evident at the universal, first Universal Rastafari Convention in Kingston in 1958, which drew about 300 people from around the island. Women who followed the Rastafari movement also played an essential role in expanding it despite facing discrimination. During the 1960s, Paulette Sweeney became a part of the movement and witnessed the vilification, despite being raised, as she said, by well-known parents. She was subjected to derogatory comments such as being accused of transforming into a dirty rasta. This disparaging, this disparagement, sorry, had graver implications, impacting women such as Fisher. On the morning of February 26, 1970, Fisher went from Green Bottom in Sandy Bay, Clarendon, to the fishing hub of Rocky Point. While there, she selected the day's she selected from the day's catch to sell at her fish shop in Kingston over the weekend, as she has always done, had, had always done. Unbeknownst to her, this simple routine journey would be her last. Fisher was stabbed multiple times by two women, by two men, and left at the side of the road. Fisher, Fisher and Henry collaborated in 1959 to launch the ARC, an organization grounded in principles of black nationalism that also promoted the repatriation of black people desiring to return to Africa. The ARC expanded within a year triggered by its expansion within a year, triggered fears of a Rastafari uprising in the Jamaican and British governments. By October 1960, Fisher was among 15 ARC members in, indicted for treason felony under the 1869 law, marking, as others have commented, the only time the Jamaican government had ever leveled such a charge. The trial took place between October 11, 19, and, and 29, 1960. 11 and 29, 1960. 
under Jamaican law, treason felony, as you may know, was defined as planning to overthrow the government, using violence, or forcing policy changes through violence against state officials. The sentence was potentially life imprisonment. For over three decades, the British government kept, kept most of the files on the ARC under wraps. Public access was gradually granted between 1987 and 1993, leading to scholarly and public discussions. During the 1960 treason felony trial, Henry was portrayed as the central figure of the ARC and became known as the leader of the Henry Rebellion or the Henry or the Henry fiasco. Unfortunately, this representation downplayed Fisher's important role in creating and operating the ARC and perpetuated the marginalization of women in both media coverage and academic research on the Rastafari movement. Yet ARC co-founder Fisher, together with Henry, created one of the most politically influential groups of the 1950s and 1960s. Just a little biography for, on Fisher. Fisher was born in 1911 in Martha Bray, Trelawney, and was orphaned as a child. Her aunt raised her in Kingston, where she attended St. George's Primary School, despite Jesuit missionaries encountering some resistance from Jamaican parents and children due to what they call African influences. Fisher excelled in her studies, although it is unknown if she continued her formal education beyond St. George's. Her literacy and numeracy skills were highly proficient. After a short-lived marriage ending in 1942, Fisher started a fish vending business and became known for her hard work and honesty. The business allowed her to buy land at 78 Rosalie Avenue in St. Andrew's Walton Park area in 1951. She built a house and hosted prayer circle meetings with 35 women, including fellow Garveyites and associates of the Ethiopian World Federation, such as possibly Miss Green, Iris Davis, and Carmen Clark, who were all members of the Ethiopian World Federation. In 1959, Fisher met Henry at the Palisados Airport in Kingston, intending to expand her prayer circle, which led to the creation of the ARC. Fisher recognized Henry as a valuable ally in advancing the cause of black nationalism in Jamaica. Although the ARC appeared to be male-dominated on the surface, this was due to the ingrained patriarchal beliefs that placed men in leadership roles. It is important to note that Fisher viewed her role as equal to Henry's, but with different responsibilities. Henry was the spiritual guide, while Fisher was responsible for commercial and administrative matters. Together, they established the political agenda of the ARC. Fisher's involvement with the Garvey movement likely influenced her comprehension of gender equality. Universal African Motor Corp, a paramilitary unit within the Garvey movement, as many have told us, mainly consisted of women who trained for combat like their male counterparts. Fisher carried out similar practices in the ARC and emphasized the importance of discipline for the efficient functioning of the organization. Women wore the same uniforms as men to represent their dedication and discipline to the organization. On October 1, 1959, 1,200 people gathered at the ARC's Emancipation Jubilee celebration. This gathering brought back the sense of unity and enthusiasm that was once associated with Pinnacle. Like the move to Pinnacle, many supporters sold their homes and assets to contribute to their planned repatriation back to Africa. Unfortunately, the ARC failed to fulfill its promises, and a public meeting scheduled for October 5, 1959 turned chaotic. 
The disorder led to police intervention, according to the Gleaner. This, this event, perceived by the authorities as additional proof of the ARC's expansive following, increased their suspicion of the organization. The ARC's support base raised concerns about their leaders promoting, possibly, communism, for example. Concerns investigated after the Cuban Revolution in July 1959. So the context was against them. When the US and, and Britain were monitoring the Caribbean region for signs of communism. The context of Cold War politics intensified the fear of the ARC, basically. In March 1960, a meeting was held in Jonestown, Kingston, with Richard Hart, whom I met, a prominent leader of the People's Federation Freedom Movement, PFM, who was known for his Marxist um, beliefs since the 1930s. And I think Nigel Bolland calls him the most articulate or the most well-known Marxist Jamaica had produced. At the meeting also was Joseph O'Sullivan, an Irish-Canadian associate of the PFM. And I know you might have heard about O'Sullivan from, um, from, from other people, um, particularly Robert Hill. Um, so Joseph O'Sullivan was at this meeting, and O'Sullivan suggested educating the ARC leaders about Marxism. However, he had to flee to Cuba on June 30, 1960, as the police pursued him for questioning. Ivy Harris, Another PFM, influential PFM member, also met with ARC leaders and followers in St. Andrew and Clarendon. Okay? However, in April 1960, Kenneth Blackburn, our first black governor, informed the British authorities that Manley's, Norman Manley's government was worried about the Jamaica Labour Party and the PFM's alleged attempts to convince Rastafari members to vote against the PNP. Police reports showed tension between Rastafari members and the PNP, the People's National Party, that's Manley's party, possibly instigated by the opposition, JLP, the Jamaica Labour Party's supporters. The politics was against them. Anthropologist Sylvia Winter's 1960 claim that Rastafari members were offered support for their return to Africa in return for votes and aggression against the PNP's rivals and the JLP's rivals added some credibility to this view. Despite Rastafari's support for the JLP or the left and the leftist parties being a concern, the threat of an ARC-led coup was deemed more significant. On April 6, 1960, police from St. Andrew's Halfway Tree Station raided Fisher's home at 78 Rosalie Avenue. The raid was led by Deputy Superintendent Wilfred McIntosh, who carried warrants to prevent potential ARC violence. Fisher's bedroom was the first part of the house to be searched, highlighting her crucial role in the ARC. The police seized machetes, knives, weapons of various types, um, batons, uniforms, ammunition, detonators, dynamite, cannabis. Letters addressed to Fidel Castro, as were letters from Henry's son in New York, that's Reynold Henry, were also found. Evidence mostly came from Fisher's bedroom, by the way including seven dynamite sticks, a fine wire coil, and a dagger. So they found what they went to find. Fisher, along with Henry and 13 other church members, were arrested by the police on charges of treason felony. During her trial, Fisher denied any involvement or knowledge of treasonous activities, but admitted to her role in establishing and running the ARC. A letter addressed to Castro, signed by 12 persons, including Fisher as the brigadier, was also presented as evidence. Henry did not sign the letter. 
Fisher claimed that she signed the letter without knowing the contents or the intended recipient. Well, however, it was clear that she held a leadership position within the ARC based on her interactions with men such as Calvert Beckford, who enters this story. And according to Fisher's documentation submitted in court, Henry tended to appoint male subordinates, which she disagreed with. Fisher recounted a troubling inc incident, um, including Beckford, and Beckford was one of these. And she recounted a troubling incident um, where men carrying knives claimed that Beckford had authorized them to, to carry knives. And when she confronted him, he cited biblical justification for carrying a weapon. Fisher was determined to reduce Beckford's influence over the church and sought Henry's help since he had, after all, placed Beckford in the church. Henry promised to address the situation. The prosecution at the trial couldn't call Beckford, by the way, um, because couldn't call him as a witness due to his untimely death. Now, you might have heard this part before, but Beckford was killed in Red, Red Hills, in um, St. Andrew, on June 15, 1960, purportedly by Reynold Henry, the son of Claudius Henry. In addition, Reynold Albert, um, in addition to Reynold, Albert Gabidon, Eldridge Morgan, William Jetter, faced trials for treason and the homicides of Beckford, Gerald Scott, R. MacDonald, who were all posthumously labeled as Rastafarian cultists. The accused quartet was also tried for the murders of Bran Methasel and David Philpott, both members of the um, Royal Hampshire Regiment in residence at the um, upper camp in Kingston. And after being found guilty, in sep on September 30, 1960, they were all sentenced to death by hanging, and it was carried out. After the trial involving Fisher, the jurors concluded that she was involved with Henry in a plan to overthrow the government. It is unclear if Fisher's testimony, or parts of it, was a carefully planned scheme by her and Henry to protect her freedom. In the end, she was sentenced to three years in prison while Henry received 10 years. So they are in prison. Then they came out. They married in 1967, a year following Henry's early release from the St. Catherine District Prison for Good Behavior. And by the way, by this time, Fisher was out because she got three years, okay? Having been released three years before Henry, Fisher had already rekindled a community of ARC members at Kemp's Hill in Clarendon, which Henry later joined. Fisher relocated to Kemp's Hill upon release from prison in 1963 and commenced the groundwork for a new organization. Henry subsequently christened the New Creation International Peacemakers Association. Initially based in Kemp's Hill, they eventually moved to a compound known as Bethel in Greenbottom, Sandy Bay. Um, the Bethel compound also resembled Pinnacle, functioning as a religious and entrepreneurial community with a block making factory, a bakery, a farm, and residences. And people who are, who are old enough, like my grandparents, used to talk about the bread, the peacemaker's bread, like it apparently was very good, <laughs> right? Um, so, and it was a prosperous community. Despite her significant contributions to the peacemakers, the revival, Fisher's role in its creation and operation was also overlooked, mainly due to the society's emphasis on Henry's activities. In his well-known memoir, the Groundings with My Brothers, published in 1969. Historian Walter Rodney wrote about Henry's leadership in establishing, quote, an independent black economic community at Kemp's Hill. Rodney did not mention Fisher's crucial involvement in organizing this community. However, Fisher was the one who revitalized the church with many young members, including some of these people here with many young members 
um, not meeting Henry until years later when he was released from prison in 1966. The church, church's growth began even before Henry's release, and by 1967 68, it had a following of 4,000 with 1,000 active members. So, 4,000 affiliates, 3,000 affiliates, 1,000 active members. And it was not an exaggeration, by the way. After moving to the Bethel compound in Sandy Bay, Fisher found also, founded also the Croft School, later renamed the Ethiopian Peacemaker School. The school was established to provide African education for children, just like what they were trying to do at Pinnacle. Fisher's untimely death in 1970 signaled the decline of the Peacemakers Association, a downturn made more pronounced, pronounced by subsequent revelations of financial misconduct. Her earlier influence had cultivated the organization's black nationalist ideology and bolstered its so social standing through her leadership abilities. Despite the government painting the ARC as violent and racist, thereby scapegoating them, the organization managed to amass a significant following. In 1960, the arrests of key ARC members, including Fisher, ignited protests, major protests, outside the courtroom, down to the church, the St. Andrew's Parish Church, I think it's called, the one in Halfway Tree, um, which intensified the government's anxieties about over the potential Rastafari uprising. That's what the protests did. So they sealed their fate. Protesters clamored for the release of their leaders and the recognition of their right to return to Africa. This unrest also led other Rastafari leaders to commission a study from the University of the West Indies. Um, Dabney, for instance, a United Rasses organization, it was called, came and, it's in the records, spoke to Rex Netterford and said, we wanted to study Rastafari, end of deal. This unrest, they, they, they came and the universe advocating for more comprehensive understanding of the movement. That's what they wanted. And, this was the result, the 1960 publication, the Rastafari Movement in Kingston, Jamaica. And you can see, I showed you, well, the first one is the foreword that Arthur Lewis was the principal wrote, right? And he made it clear, they wanted, the movement wanted this. But I, it was, it's deliberate to kind of show you the original cover, and then, you see how it's becoming the kind of male image taking over? I'm telling you. So in 1961, the Rastafari, and all, all respect to, to um, Daniel Hartman, by the way. In 1961, Rastafari representatives, Fillmore Alvaranga and Douglas Mack, wrote a letter to the British Prime Minister, um, dis distancing the movement from Fisher and the ARC. Mortimer Plano, Mortimer Plano, an emerging Rastafari figure went further by labeling the ARC leadership as infiltrators in a 1973 lecture at York University in Canada. I'm going to end now. I know you have questions. Nonetheless, these events showed the widespread interest generated by the ARC. And that's the important point. Despite the male dominant culture, Fisher played a significant role in stimulating the academic interests and gaining international recognition for the Rastafari movement. It's unfortunate how it came, but it came. All right? Her ideas also impacted future generations of women who continued to push for gender equality within the movement. Thank you very much for coming out and listening. Very much, Prof. Um, we're going to ask you to stay there. Yep. We're going to have a question and answer um, section. And I know that there are a number of people actually following us um, online, some of whom have said, especially, good evening. Some of your colleagues from our former colleagues from our history department, Jenny Jemot and Nicole Plummer. Um, okay. So there is an audience here, and there are questions coming in online. And if there are people who are following the live feed and want to leave questions, I'm reminding you, please to do so. 
I will also um, be taking questions from our live audience. Um, while I give you a moment just to prepare yourself um, with your questions, there was one question in the live chat from SGS Media um, saying, so how do they resist colonialism um, and yet still remain loyal to the crown? And I think possibly that question was posed before you went into your your okay. explanation. I do think you addressed it, but I just wanted, if I could, to add an anecdote in support of what you said, um, mm -hmm. while, as I said, the audience gets their questions ready. I remember reading it. I'm sorry that I cannot remember the source, but I read um, an exchange between a planter and a slave. Um, that kind of really speaks to the nature of resistance, which is what I think you are trying to illustrate, where this master is addressing his slaves in the courtyard in front of the great house, and he calls one of them out in particular, Quaker. Tell me. What do I look like? And Quaker says, oh, sir, strong. You're strong. Robust. <laughs> and say, Quaker, how else do I look? Handsome man, sir. Handsome man. <laughs> so you, you can almost see now the, the, the wheels turning in master head. Is, is Quaker insulting me? Is Quaker serious? So he pushes him further. How else do I look, Quaker? Oh, regal master. Regal. <laughs> regal Quaker. Regal master. Mm. Just like a lion. Yeah. So like a lion, Quaco, when, when have you ever seen a lion? So just yesterday, sir, Master Joe had one taking crops to the market. Master said, that's not a lion, that's a jackass. <laughs> and he said, well, Master, that's what you look like. Right? <laughs> no, no, Master is probably at this moment saying, is Quaco insulting me or is Quaco just an idiot? <laughs> and the thing is, Quaco is using Master's perception of him as an idiot. Right. against him, right. Right? right? And I'm just saying, you know, I think you went on to explain in yeah. ways, saying you're loyal and who subject doesn't necessarily mean what it says it's as a written. formality. Right, you know? exactly. And we have to tell our students, and this is for the students, we have to teach our students. This is the thing which, I mean, I didn't invent this stuff, but since the 1970s, you know, history is, you know, the historical turn, as we call it. You know, the idea of reading documents against the grain. You know, the, what you see in the documents, there's another story there, especially if you're looking for the story of the people who didn't write these things, right? The, the, the people who they're writing about. You have to read this stuff against the grain. And you see this formality, oh, I'm a loyal and dutiful subject of His Majesty or Her Majesty and so on. So it's not legitimizing colonialism, right? I mean, I understand the idea of populist legitimism. I really do. Right? But within it also, if, you want, if you're looking for resistance, you have to look at the entire um, document and the context of the whole thing. So yeah, yeah. Um, questions? Uh, you won't be on camera, but I'm going to ask you to speak into the mic for the purpose of the live stream. Anyone? All right, we have one here and then I'll come to Dean. Yes, greetings and great presentation, Prof. Dunkley. So for those who don't know, I am Dr. Michael Barnett, who also is very interested and actually does do Rastafari studies here at UWE. Um, I do admire the fact that you have made a link. I don't know if it's deliberate or you juxtapose, and I'm going from memory from your book on the book that, that, that this presentation is based on, Rastafari Women. Mm -hmm. um, first generation, what I consider first generation Rastafari with Leonard Howell, Robert Hines, and then juxtaposed with the second generation Rastafari movement with Naya Bingi, Ras Bonaji, Bongo Water, and Prince Emmanuel, yeah. King Emmanuel, where we have a great deal of women, a, a, a large percentage, you, you point out that there's, there's a very strong female presence in the first generation, Rastafari, like the Howe Lights and Leonard Howe. But then with the second generation now, we see it's more male, I mean, especially in Naya Bingi, early Naya Bingi, it's predominantly male. It's right. almost like a pushback mm -hmm. against that. Um, I just want to get from you your perspective, what you think is responsible for that dichotomy. So uh -oh. I'm saying like a, almost yeah. like a reaction against the yeah. first generation Rastafari mm -hmm. Oz, which I would argue still, that schism still exists today, but that's another discussion. 
Yeah. Anyway, we give thanks. I'm glad to see the Peacemakers Association here in yeah. strong presence. We give yeah. thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, so, Michael, this is not an easy question to answer, by the way. Um, there are several things going on. I think that a number of the Rastafari organizations formed within mansions, formed within the 1950s, they looked at what happened to Pinnacle very seriously. And they, this male image that's being projected is part of this idea that to counteract white supremacy, you needed male supremacy, which is kind of a general thing you see across the African diaspora, okay? Um, it happens in North America too, with the Nation of Islam and the um, Black Power Movement. So that's part of it. But I also think that it might be a little deceptive because you do have women who are you know, fluid in their alignment, so they might be consider themselves part, part of several organizations. Um, and circumventing that sort of patriarchal push by this multiple affiliation. So it's difficult to say for certain that the image you're seeing, the male image you're seeing, is a legitimate, you know, or, or, or a very accurate picture. Yes, it's being projected, but is it also a reflection of what women are actually doing, you see? And the only way to get to that information is to ask the women <laughs> themselves, right? So we can talk about the patriarchal image, and that's very real, but we need to find out what the women were doing during this period as well, right? Because they were still, they didn't, they didn't disappear, they didn't decide that they're not Rasta anymore. I mean, some people probably did, but by and large, women were still involved. So it's just for some bright graduate student to kind of take this up. Some people younger than you and I. I don't believe I'm saying that. This, <laughs> I reach a point where I'm saying younger than you and that. But anyway, yeah, you know, it's interesting work because I, one of the things that came out in the larger work for me was to really inter interrogate this idea of a Rastafari as a patriarchal organization, you know, male dominated, male oriented, right? And in the, you know, in the early period, first generation as they call it, it's very clear that this is being pushed by the colonial system. This is a big part of what they're trying to do to kind of separate the people. Because if you remove the movement, you have no, you have no move. If you remove the women, you have no movement. And they knew, they looked at the statistics because they produced them and they knew that women were more religiously oriented than men. They dominated the churches, all right? So this was a big, a big part of it. And, the, and yeah, so I, I'm sorry if that sounds like a lot of rambling, but I really don't think it's very clear cut as to what happened. But I know that some of the literature say Rastafari got militarized and, you know, to defend itself and women Men came forward and women took a step back and so on. But really, if we don't study these particular groups that are projecting this male image, like Naya Bingi, in the 1950s, in that context, we won't know for certain. Right? We won't know for certain. Yeah, yeah thank you for um, interesting uh, lecture with many uh, intriguing facts. Um, I have uh, two questions. One is about, uh, you mentioned dual membership in the Baptist Church and in Rastafari organization, and I was wondering how the church responded to that. <laughs> and then the other question kind of has to do with what you just spoke about. Um, you mentioned the um, concept of community feminism, yes. and I was wondering if it was a bit like your false uh, royalism, like you posture, like the faithful servant to the crown while subverting it at the same time, if community feminism is a bit like that, posturing as conservative and not challenging gender roles while subverting those roles at the same time. Yeah. All right, let's, let's um, talk about the Baptist Church. So no, the Baptist Church did not really, I mean, there is no church in Jamaica that embraced the Rastafari. Um, I don't know if they do now, but 
back in the 1930s, it was not seen, it was not even seen as a religion, it was seen as a cult, right? And some of that is still there today, to this day. So the, there, was a, there was a case, there, there are records actually where a Baptist pastor is writing to the, the colonial authorities, asking them to arrest the Rastafari leaders because they're convincing the people to come out of the church, right? Um, there, there is also one from the Church of God in Christ or something to that effect um, in St. Thomas. So preachers from the established churches or the mainstream churches, they're, they're opposed to the movement. Right? So they did not like that people were splitting loyalties and so on. But what was going on is that the, a lot of the traditional churches, sad to say, were not really focusing, their energies were not really impacting the, the, the very poor in the country, the peasant, what we call the peasantry in history. You know, they, they, they weren't reaching them. Um, I mean, and which is surprising because Moran Bay is a peasant rebellion for the most part, and it's a Baptist-driven rebellion, right? So what is going on here? Where the Baptist Church is concerned, though, I think that it was a natural fit because that particular church had you know, very close links to the peasantry to begin with. And so when Rastafari comes, up, comes in in the 1930s and is appealing to that particular group, that base of the Baptist Church is going to be the group that is you know, more inclined towards joining the movement. So that is, is, the, is, the, is, is my explanation for it. Um, there are other theological issues as well, um, which theologians can tell you about in terms of the the, 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 the hermeneutics, hermeneutical um, similarities between Rastafari's reading of scripture and Baptist, especially black Baptist reading of scripture. There is that too, and which people could also you know, um, see. Uh, community feminism, so, uh, so what I think Eula Taylor was trying to do with community feminism was to show really how that woman, that there was no, necessarily no conflict between being a mother, you know, and, and a, a, a spouse and being politically active, that you could do both without compromising either one. I think that was the crux of it. I don't think there was, I mean, if I'm understanding your question correctly, I don't think they were um, feigning loyalty on either front. I think it was, it's just, it's the situation that many women were in, that they were family-oriented people, they, were, they had strong family links, but they were also very politically inclined. And how do you do one without compromising the other? And they figured out ways to do that, right? Which is what Del Rosa, by the way, was complaining about that the constable that no, I don't understand this, you know, that he, his idea of woman, a woman was that she should be, stop fooling around with Rastafari and all this political garbage and go sit down in the house and take care of your husband. She was saying, you're only saying that because you don't have a wife. Because <laughs> you know, that's not how wives behave, right? So, the, yeah. yeah. We had a Good evening, all. Good evening. It's a blessing to be here. We're the second generation peacemaker. And I said to Professor David, it's a very, very beautiful lecture. And for me, you bring some memory to me. Sometimes tears drop out of me a while ago when I was told of some of the blessed memory of our great mother, Edna Fisher. First and foremost, one of the key notes for me right now, she was a great educator. When she come to Kemsill Clarendon, when children were going to school without shoes, barefoot, we call it, the pride and dignity as a black woman and a Gavi, she said, no, she had bring this to a stop. She created a uniform. She go out and buy shoes 
and that every children that was going to school could be properly dressed and wearing shoes. You know, said so the government never liked it at that time because race school, school, everybody got race school, school in race course in Clarion, and I got be a foot with them, take it as nothing. But the government feel like, oh, she's a happy tea. You come and tell black people, pick me, say them, they're not supposed to walk, be a foot. That's what we grew up on. Mother Edna was keen in the upbringing of children. When she moved to Clarendon, 19 miles where we are presently located right now, she said, I'm going to stop when I'm going to go there school. And she built us a school, the one that you show. 1969, that school took three months to build, 98 of us. Three of us are students of that class, the class of 1969. Yes, she teach us the value to be a black, proud one. A universal man in her earth and woman. Don't to be trampled upon and walked down and look upon. She give us that dignity. That's why after I circle her and come back, do my little research and study, I could come back now and say, I'm going to lead the new reform for the resurrection of International Peacemaker Association. I was at Rosal Avenue at four year old when all those description of what was going on was taking place. I never recognized Mosite until when I was about 16. But the value of what Claudio and Hidden Fisher was bringing to us as black people, and he coined the phrase black power for the restoration of black people, black power for the peace of humanity, black power, for justice, truth, righteousness, for the true people of earth, the indigenous people of earth, all humanity are one. We are the children of God, we are God on earth. And if we don't hold up that now, then we'll be slave again. So we must claim our dignity as human being upon earth, whether you're black, white, pink, or brown, we all are one human walking in love and light. Give thanks and thank you very much. I am committed to getting us out of here by 8.30. I see your hand just went up. We have one, two, and then I'll make yours the final question, if we can keep it short. Thank you. Yeah, uh, good, uh, good evening. Thank you, um, Dave. I uh, really enjoyed the, the lecture. Almost by chance, I think this is the third time we kind of crossing paths this in the last few months, and it's about the same subject, which I'm, I'm growing more and more interested in. Uh, two, two, two questions. One is a quick one, I think. Uh, uh, it's, it's about con quote unquote converting, proselytizing. Are these women like reaching out to other women, how they do it, and, and, and so on? Uh, the second one, maybe question slash uh, comment. This issue of um, portraying, portraying uh, this type of movements as um, patriarchal and so on, uh, which is kind of common across the colonial, uh, uh, colonial world, and, and it, it's happening or it was happening also in Africa and so on, in, in, in terms of like how uh, they're trying to push women to marry according to the Christian rights in, in, instead of the traditional rights and so on when in fact women were becoming uh, more subservient as a result of it because it was much harder for them to break away from marriages, right? Uh, so I see those similarities there, but at the same time, I think, and I, I, I wonder, based on what you have explained, how they are portraying the movement as patriarchal and in a way sort of dismissing the role of, of women, Another way of looking at it is from the perspective of taking advantage of it. In a sense, basically, do they, were they able to capitalize, to enjoy greater sort of autonomy to do things that maybe their male counterparts would not have been able, able to do? So that is my, my second question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's very interesting um, questions. The first one is connected to what... Um, Dean Kornberg asked, right? Um, why the churches were upset? <laughs> they were proselytizing people. There is a, um, 
there is an altercation I, I remember um, between a, a woman, um, I can't remember her name, but she, she was, it's, and it's reported in the Gleaner, because the police intervened because they almost, it almost broke out in disorder, where she's having this argument with all of the church people because she's trying to get them to see that the church is deceiving them, right? And trying to get them into Rastafari. So there's an active role um, for women in trying to convert people, basically, as you refer to it. But for Rastafari, it's kind of tricky to use the word conversion because it's not really how it works in Rastafari. You know, it's, um, you have to take a personal journey, right? And um, you have to see and believe, right? Um, I'm not a theologian, by the way, so I struggle with this part. So, um, but uh, yeah, they are proselytizing, and that's another source of discontent for the churches, because women are very much involved in this, and precisely because they know women are. If you get the women, you're gonna get the men. Okay. They m capitalizing on the male image. Okay. Certainly. Okay. Because remember, from what we know, um, Rastafari, the known founders of Rastafari were men, right? That's what we know. There might be, I think there's something else to know, right? But we need some grad students to do this stuff. Right, Michael? <laughs> right? So anyhow, um, they very much capitalized on that male sort of foundational image, right? Um, and it's part there, a lot of the letters that are being written to the government are also being written by men, by Rastafari men. So there is this impression in the government that if they b explode this sort of patriarchal thing, so these are all, you know, criminal men who are dangerous and con trying to convince women to come into this danger, they can just pull the legs from under the, this movement. Right? So yes, you're right, there is, but they were very good at blowing this thing up to the point where the, the, that's what everybody believed, right? In fact, by the time they reached Pinnacle, this is a story that the women are up there, they're all, um, you know, they're all being exploited by men at Pinnacle. And Leonard Howell has like nine wives or something like 12, some ridiculous number, right? Um, yes, there's a, in the bigger work, there is engagement with Leonard Howell's philandery. I mean, he was a philanderer. It's very clear, right? But the, um, there is a conversation to be had about women's um, challenging of that particular situation up, up at Pinnacle, right? Um, and of course, when you're talking about pin patriarchy, you, you have to be very careful not to downplay the oppression that women experience, um, because it's um, it, it was very real in in, in Rastafari, right? Uh, and and yes, you're right. The, the colonial government did just capitalize on on it as well. Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you for that, Professor Dunkley. I'm sorry I missed the very start of it. Um, but your lecture reminds me about the, um, the complex approaches to Rastafari uh, research. Um, I'm glad you included the statement by Mortimer Planner because of my own field work, um, I've tended to ignore this whole Henry saga, which is the position of the planners um, I've unwittingly um, taken. But I think your lecture points us to a direction perhaps which is emerging in the 60s. Um, and we do know that the movement is becoming more splintered um, post independence. Mm -hmm. But uh, perhaps based on the experience with the ARC there is more explicitly 
the rejection of the religious um, layering, which is what I'm more accustomed to, um, seeing the movement not in churchical, but more in political, organizational, active repatriation on certain kinds of agendas that were not so explicitly congregational in, the, in, this, in this sense. I'm wondering if in your own uh, survey of the archives, if you've seen any correspondence between the leaders like Howell and the planner, um, and I'm, I'm reminded that they are a generation that, based on the convention in Bacowal, had been somewhat in touch with one another, even if they weren't unified. So I'm, I'm wondering if the archives help us in any way. Thanks. It's, it's an important question. Um, did, did Howell, Henry, and Plano, the emerging stars of the 1960s, did they correspond? I think they did, um, but I, haven't, I can't recall seeing any um, correspondence between Plano and Howell or um, Henry. I know that Plano spoke about the Henrys, right? Everybody did, because it was such a major, major event. And I say Henrys because remember they got married in 1967, right? 1966 or 67. But um, no, I haven't seen the, any correspondence between them. What, what is there though is like, there is, I don't know how to phrase this. They had mutual connections, like, people who they would com communicate through, right? So for instance, you had, um, you had people trying, like, like the PFM people, Richard Hart, um, Ivy Harris, who was moving around all the different movements or mansions that are established in the 1950s, trying to strum up support for this minor Marxist party that they had formed, right? And so, they are saying to, to Henry, they are saying to the remaining Howellites, they are saying to the Nyabinge, look, you know, come, come, you know, all these Rastafari people, they are on board with this thing. We need to, you know, Marxism is the class element that combines us, you know, and you provide the spiritual guide and so on, which is kind of strange for Marxists to say, but they look, they are looking for support. So, but that's the only correspondence I can. I can glean. I didn't see anything like people writing to each other, right? Um, however, there is a lot. Of, there are a lot that I got mountain of letters between politicians and the Rastafari leadership. In case anybody is interested, especially in the 19, late 1960s, right up to 1980. Yep, and you get very interested to see what's going on. You know. Michael Manley, Edward Siaga, oh, everybody, they're writing back and forth to Rastafari leaders. And trying to, because the, the politics of this country is always acknowledged that right? if you get the Rastafari on your side, you're getting the country, you know, because if, the Rast, if you can convince Rastafari <laughs> to vote for you, <laughs> who am I to resist, <laughs> right? And Sylvia Winter, you know, she, that was her, her, part of her conversation in the early um, 60s, all right? But yeah, there is correspondence there in case um, people want to look. There's something to be said here, um, just I want to add that about history, that we have to, I did this because this, this stuff started in the archives, that's where I started which is a traditional historical approach to history. You go to the archives, you read the document. But then I realized that some of the people here, I could actually talk to them, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I went and I spoke to them several times. And you know, I found myself doing ethnographic work, which I had no training in, right? But it was so enriching to the history because it, you know, did the range, it diversified the perspectives and it gave me sort of more connection, a way in which to read the documents from the archives, you know, departing from the impression that this is the last word, 
you know, we'll ever have here, you know. And I'm so grateful for the time people spend with me, because we spend a lot of time doing this thing. This thing has been going on since 2014, yeah. So you're talking seven, where, where are we, 2023? I said, tw tw nine years of, yeah, yeah. And some of the people have died. You have transitioned, right? Right? Yeah. Hello, Dr. Dunkley. Hi. Um, mine is more in alignment with politics. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to find out if the, if the movement was really in support of the JLP or the PNP by virtue of the letters that were found in Ms. Fisher's bedroom, or were the, those letters fabricated, or was it a matter of the JLP simply trying to woo the, the, the Rastas? Because from, as far as I'm concerned, and by, by what I know from history, it would seem to me that the PNP was a stronger contender than the JLP. So was it fabricated, or was it just the JLP trying to woo? the movement they all courted friendship with, the, with it that was the that was the point you see they all tried to get the rastafari to vote right this is what the police was telling the um governor right so the british government the u.s government they were convinced that this was all about communism that this was the influence of castro and the letter addressed to castro didn't help right um, there's a story about that which, you know, because they were looking to different ways to defend themselves. Castro just produced a successful revolution. Why not? <laughs> you know, man, have, man obviously can defend you, right? But what the police was saying was that all the political parties were trying to influence the Rastafari, right? The PNP, the JLP, the PFM, they were all going around trying to, right? Who won in the end? I don't know, I don't know. I, 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 the Rastafari, I put up a candidate in 1961, that's 62, that's Eli, Samuel Brown, who got one vote? 80, what? You got 83 votes? Wow, yeah, okay. So, that's pretty much how successful the, pol the politicians were, right? However, however, in the 1970s, Michael Manley became very influential in Rastafari. His symbolism, his adoption of Rastafari symbolism was very strong. He was very clever in that. He wrote copious letters to Henry who was still alive, because Fisher dies in 1970. And I personally think that if she was alive, she wouldn't have allowed this to happen, right? But um, there are letters where Manley's, you know, telling Henry, keep, 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 keep things on, on the lid down there in Clarendon, you know? Because Clarendon is an important parish, by the way. That was the constituency of Shera, Hugh Shera. That's the other part of the story you didn't hear. It's in the book. By the way, so Kemsill and Walter Rodney says this very clearly. Kemsill, Kemsill is lodged right in the middle of Hugh Shearer's constituency. Hugh Shearer is the JLP, right? So Manley, Norma, Michael Manley capitalizes on this. And this is very important for Manley. It's an important accomplishment and something he actually prided himself on doing because remember his father incarcerated Henry and Fisher. It was his father's government. Norman Manley, 1960, right? So it was a major accomplishment for him, for Michael to transform the Manley name from being you know, suppressive of Rastafari to supportive of Rastafari, right? And Henry was a major part of that. I'd, yeah. But so, so, you know, you want to, there's a good deal of Jamaican politics in this story, you see? That's why I keep telling people, this is not, this is Rastafari studies, yes, 
but this is Jamaican history, man. You know? And there's a big chunk of it that's happening, that's playing out, because in, in Rastafari, right? Because if you get Rastafari, you get the country. That's how it works in Jamaica. Yeah? All right, and on that note, I just wanted to read a couple of comments from the live chat on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps you might recognize a Mamadou from Missouri. They wanted to know that they are watching from Missouri. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> says, great lecture indeed. Um, in, uh, sorry, I didn't catch the name, but our visitors here, there have been a couple of comments in response to your testimony. Um, one person saying that it really has been the high point of the evening to see the students who have benefited from Fisher and who are now here. So I just wanted to pass on that comment. That's Douglas and, Mack. That's right. um, Douglas Mackey, Sister B, Vicente, Herman Jarrett, and the new generation. Okay. Okay. All right. And just for us as the audience, so before the formal thanks, to thank our presenter again for that. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give the presenter another round of applause. So I had everything planned out how I wanted the vote of thanks to go, but then I saw how the lecture turned out and different things came to mind. I want to first thank our speaker, Professor Dunkley. I can tell you online, offline, I have some friends who are also watching, but we're not commenting in the chat, and they love the lecture. So I can tell you, very good job. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dean Cohenberg um, for opening the floor for the evening's proceedings, to Professor Robertson for opening the space for the lecture. Um, thank Dr. Cressa for leading the evening's proceedings overall and also taking care of the question and answer session. Uh, I'd also like to thank you, our audience. It's one thing to have a lecture, but if we don't have an audience to present to what is the sense. And so I also want to thank the admin staff that supports the lectures every year, those from the Department of History and Archaeology, those from the Faculty of Humanities and Education Faculty Office. Every year they make it happen. Every year people tune in and express their appreciation and we here appreciate it too. And we also want to thank, well, I want to thank on behalf of us here, the people who made it possible to have the live stream. And because we have a live stream, we have an online audience that I also want to thank for tuning in and asking the questions that they did. And I suggest that you take a look at the chat if you can, yeah. because yeah, there are some questions I think you'd be interesting, okay. interested in. Okay. Um, the book he refers to, Women and Resistance in the Early Rastafari Movement. I've had the privilege and the pleasure to have looked at it for other purposes. And okay. yes, for, for um, another radio program. And I am suggesting that you get a copy, you won't regret it. And I also want to thank our friends in media. Kabu from the Africa Forum, she's also watching live. Um, she hosts the Africa Forum on IRFM. She has always supported everything related to Elsa Govaya, and she supports this latest venture and I just want to say thanks again. Um, to close out, you know, the high point I think for almost everyone would be our visitors here who are the students who were actually able to benefit from Fisher. I just want to give another round of applause to them. As a token of our appreciation to thank your wife, I did not forget you to thank you for giving us of your husband and your family's time just to be here. And I can see the glow in your eyes. Thank you for being the support system that has helped him to be here. Just want to give you both a token of appreciation. So this is from the department. Um, we appreciate that you were able to make the time to come here. Um, I don't know if you still get stage fright at this point. But if you did, it didn't show, and thank you. And thank you for, for everybody else from the different departments who turned out to, su to support us. And Dr. Kenzie, it's nice to see you joining us as well. <laughs>
All right, so have a good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us uh, next year. I hope we can do it even bigger and better. Yeah. Thank you very much. Pardon? Yes, it's everywhere books are sold. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. Yes, yes, uh, yes. I, I actually can show you what it is.